The Oscars are coming up on March 27th. It's the culmination of awards season, and it's always a fun moment to take stock of where the documentary industry is these days. I am definitely not the most knowledgeable when it comes to film festivals and award circuits, but I do love how most years at the Oscars, the documentary nominations seem to reflect the huge range of styles and budgets and subject matters that the art form encapsulates. Big budget, low budget, big teams, solo or two-person efforts, historical films, contemporary observational films, and it's fun to see all those take center stage at the same time. So heading into this year's award show, I wanted to bring someone on the show who knows far more about the Oscars and the film industry as a whole than I do to help us preview this year's documentary category. And so I'm so excited to welcome Ann Thompson to the show. Ann is the editor at large at IndieWire and has been a contributor to the New York Times, Washington Post, The Observer, and Wired. She also has served as film columnist at Variety and deputy editor of Variety.com. So Ann, welcome to the show. Thank My you so pleasure. Much. Yeah. So to begin with, I'd love to learn a little bit of like, what is this time of year like for a journalist who covers the film industry with the Oscars right on the horizon? Well, we've been back out on the circuit uh, now that, the, you know, things have, have uh, lightened up. So we're, it's hectic, you know, and they postponed a lot of things. Uh, and so the past couple of weeks have just been one thing after another, all piled up mm. um, with the Oscars coming on, on the 27th. So it's just nonstop. What kind of things did they postpone? Oh, well, there's the different Guild Awards, the WGA, the, the is it coming up, the PGA, last week was the DGA, and and uh, the Critics' Choice Awards, and uh, the BAFTAs, mm. uh, all of the, you know, usually they're spread out a little more over time, you know, over the course of, of the whole period between January and, and March, and now they're all in okay. March. And they're all in March, okay, and so you've been covering a lot of those, or most of those, gotcha. Um, so... Where are we? Are can you give us kind of a broad picture of awards season or um, kind of like the Oscars? To me, from my understanding, is it's kind of like the culmination. It's the big one, um, but specifically in documentary, um, what do you think there is to 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 know about like um, the important award shows and what they can tell us leading into this coming weekend? Okay, so if, if you want to look at the signs for, for documentary, there have been two films that have basically been winning a lot of the big awards. So you would have the International Documentary um, Awards, um, you would have the um, uh, Cinema Eye Honors, um, and each of the guilds uh, gives an award to a documentary. Um, BAFTAs give awards, so so and Critics' Choice. So the two of them have been kind of splitting it up. Um, mm. Summer of Soul, mm -hmm. uh, which has has just been doing very well all along, and then you also have the uh, documentary Flea, which uh, was uh, also nominated for animation and international film, which is very unusual. Wow. Uh, first time that you've had a doc like that uh, nominated in three categories at the Oscars. So that's a sign of strength. Yeah. It's a sign, you know, because what is it about at the Oscars? You know, you want you want your movie to win. Um, but when you when it comes to the these these more rarefied categories, mm -hmm. how many people in the overall 9000 member Academy voting pool have actually seen mm. uh, documentaries and have, have taken the time and have seen the animated features or have seen uh, the international features. So it's still a small club. Yeah. But the more categories you're nominated in, the more people have seen your movie. Right. But so it's interesting to say, you know, why would it be Flea or why would it be Summer of Soul? Summer of Soul has been widely seen. It's Searchlight and it's it's a, a, a very enjoyable, very important historic uh, 1969 concert that a lot of people missed. Mm -hmm. And the footage from it was buried for 50 years. And it's the rookie uh, debut, obviously, of... Um, I mean, request Love Thompson, who as a late night staple uh, in people's living rooms, he, you know, he's beloved. Yeah, he people has no adore him. him. Yeah. Uh, and when you see him out and about on the circuit, you see that people adore him. It's mm. palpable. 
Mm. You know, you remember that. Yeah. Um, so um, this guy, uh, Jonas um, Poer Rasmussen from Denmark, is, isn't pulling the same, you know, celebrity weight, uh, the flea director. Right. Um, so I would have thought with Ukraine going on in the news that this very heartfelt um, upsetting, um, heart tugging, if you like, uh, Afghanistan documentary would really be very much in people's minds mm. uh, as a, a good contender for documentary. And it, and it is, mm. but it's, it's, it's hard to argue with Summer of Soul. So it, it, it'll be one of those two guys. Um, but t there were so many great documentaries this year. Yeah. So all of the nominees are uh, elevated yeah. by, by being in the race. Yeah. And we're going to get into to some of those other ones as well. Um, but one thing that you mentioned brought up a, a good question that I've been pondering, which is for these documentaries, even as someone who loves documentaries and I'm always going out of my way to see as many as I can, sometimes they can be hard to find on, on all the different streaming services. I believe that Writing with Fire, which is one of the nominations, hasn't even been on a streaming service um, or it was only on one recently. It's going to be on television okay. just before the Oscars, literally okay. like the day before or the day after or something. Yeah. So I wonder... How much does that matter when it comes to the voting in the Oscars, whether something is on a streaming for service that everyone has versus one that's hard to access, like Writing with Fire? I know that most voters would get screeners, but does that actually matter? They don't matter? have screeners anymore. Um, oh, okay. I mean, they, they do. I mean, some people still send them, but the Academy doesn't. Mm. They're not in the screener business anymore, but what they have is the portal. Um, okay. And every uh, Oscar voter, assuming that they can manage to use it, um, and some of the older ones have trouble <laughs> with that. Um, but uh, no, they, they watch it on the portal. And so all right. the documentary, uh, all the movies, every single short, every single thing that's been nominated is available. And they've been doing screenings, too. They've been actually doing um, real life. Uh, screenings and and you can you can assume that all the publicists who are pushing their their um, contenders are sending links and sending screening opportunities to everybody that they can. Okay. Um, so I get I I'm lucky I get to see everything, but um, so do the Academy voters. Yeah. Okay. All right. So they sh they do have access. To the, so the accessibility. But what they're missing yeah. is that that kind of um, buzz that occurs with a theatrical release, mm. you know, that kind of word of mouth and that kind of must see thing. That's why I'm kind of assuming that Summer of Soul has been seen by more people. By more people, right, yeah. And, and in documentaries in a situation like that, You'd like to think that the Oscar voters would only vote for um, in a category where they had seen all five films. Mm -hmm. They the they case. do. Yeah, they vote for what they've seen. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, before we jump into um, each of the nominees this year, I wonder if we want to give a shout out to any of the films that were not selected as nominees. I know personally, for me, when I saw the nominees come out, I was quite surprised to not see. Um, the National Geographic documentaries, The First Wave, and um, The Rescue come out. I wonder if you have any reflections on that. Yeah, if those were widely hailed and very, very respected, uh, very admired. Um, they're incredible movies, both of them. Um, it's impossible not to observe over time that the documentary branch tends not to award nominations to movies that have or filmmakers who have already won. Mm. Oh, interesting. So um, the the uh, the filmmakers behind the rescue had already won mm -hmm. for that uh, incredible mountain climbing. Yeah, free movie. solo, right? And then the other one, um, there are two uh, COVID movies this mm -hmm. year, mm -hmm. and I kind of assumed that one of them would get in, and I thought in the same breath and uh, First Wave were both extraordinary. Yeah. And in the same breath was also about China and and really visually stunning. And I, I just thought they would both, one of them at least, would get in. But apparently a lot of people have had trouble watching COVID mm. movies. Yeah. Which is understandable. Yeah. And I, a lot of people think that's why those two films didn't, didn't make it. Mm. Um, so that's the explanation uh, yeah. for those three films. Yeah. It both... 
is completely understandable because I had that same feeling of like, okay, am I feeling up to watching those, you know, on this evening? But also, it's also shocking to not have any film representing this thing that we've all gone through for the and past couple of years. Yeah, um, I know. Yeah. Quick question. You mentioned the documentary branch. Is that something that's different than... You said the documentary branch doesn't tend to award. So or is, the yeah. the uh, nominations process okay. at the academy there are um, twenty three categories, mm. and there are seventeen branches of the academy, and um, each branch votes for their. They all everybody votes for best picture. Okay. So they all nominate for best picture. They pick their favorites, and. Um, the, so you would have some branches like the producers and the publicists and the um, executives that would only be able to vote for Best Picture. But the craft branches, the directors, the editors, the writers, the documentary, the animation and shorts, uh, they all vote for their own categories. Okay. And then the one that um, it has a committee, if you see all the films, you can vote in it, is the international because okay. that spreads out across all the different branches. And um, if you want to vote for animation, you can join that committee too and vote for that. Oh, okay. uh, if you, so it's, a, it's, a, it's different for oh, all okay. the different. Yeah. So the music branch votes for a song and score, for example. Okay. The sound branch votes for sound uh, and so forth. And those would be people who have a specialty or a background in that particular that's why they're in the academy right, because they're right. really good uh exemplars of their field yeah. they have succeeded and they've they've managed to gain entrance yeah. to uh the academy that's why it's special right so for this year's documentary nominees um i thought we'd go through them i have written a little bit of a, of a synopsis of each one so i'll give like the one or two liner um, for each nominee and then I'd love to just kind of open it up to see if you have any thoughts about the movie what you liked what you thought was interesting about it and we can move from there how's that sound okay yeah so the first one we're going to go in alphabetical order first one we have is ascension and the log line for that is ascension examines the contemporary Chinese dream through staggering observations of labor consumerism and wealth in cinematically exploring the aspiration that drives today's People's Republic of China, the film plunges into universal paradoxes of economic progress. And I believe if there is anyone that wants to check this out before the Oscars, I believe it's on Paramount+. Plus. Um, so that is Ascension. And any, any thoughts that you have uh, after seeing Ascension? The main thing about Ascension... Um... Jessica Kingdon did an amazing job uh, with with the visuals. It's mm -hmm. just extraordinary. She's she's showing us the scale um, and scope of China in all of its massive glory, mm -hmm. and it's it's often quite beautiful. Um, so a lot of people uh, have been struck by the fact that it sort of lacks um, the usual narrative uh, thrust of, of most documentaries, that it's, it feels as though it's weaving in and out of different worlds and showing you different things in a kind of lyrical way. Um, and people just adore it. Um, it. It has, you know, done very well through through the whole season. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I wasn't at all surprised um, that it landed uh, an Oscar nomination. Yeah, I, I saw this a couple weeks ago, and I'm someone who's particularly drawn to documentaries that have that narrative thrust, that have character-driven stories. And so in the first 10 minutes going into the movie, not knowing anything about it, I started to get a little bit nervous if this was going to be something I liked, but I found myself by the end of it just being completely captivated. It's and kind of mesmerizing. Yeah, yeah. it's really yeah. mesmerizing. And um, like you said, the visuals were amazing. Pretty much every frame you know, was locked on a tripod. Um, I was interested to learn that the director and cinematographer, neither of which I believe speak fluent Chinese. And so they were just shooting a ton of footage and kind of in the edit learning about all the uh, the quotes that they were getting after translation came through. And yeah, I think it, it's a it's a really compelling film that that worked for me. Um, 
and yeah, so that's Ascension. Okay, any any um, notable wins that they've had that might suggest they'd have any shot? They have. They they've been nominated okay. in all the big you know places that you would want to be. They just haven't won. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, the next we have is Attica. The summary. This unnervingly vivid dive into the 1971 uprising from Emmy-winning director Stanley Nelson sheds new light on the enduring violence and racism of the prison system and highlights the urgent, ongoing need for reform 50 years later. Very true. Um, This is a case where you have a filmmaker that uh, earned his bona fides over many years, so, so they're rewarding him for that. He worked um, with a collaborator, Tracy Curry, who is an archivist, and they got some extraordinary footage. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the reason that Attica is is in this lineup isn't necessarily because it was the best directed or flashiest visually or anything like that, Mm -hmm. but the footage is so shocking and so horrifying and so... um, we knew that Attica took place. We we remember. Man, I was around at the time. I mean, I remember that there was an uprising, but we I never saw this footage of of prisoners being treated in in a way that mm. is is um reminiscent of of the horrors of World War Two. I mean, it is really disgusting. Yeah. and horrifying. Yeah. how they're treated. And it seemed it's like torture. It's torture, and it's yeah. bad. Yeah. yeah, it's it's tough to watch for sure. Um, it seemed like in, I, I, I was not around when it happened. So, um, I, I was actually learning about it for the, the first time and, and was shocked to learn so much about it. And it seemed like a well covered event at the time. Like they did show that there were many news cameras and I was wondering, and interviewed some of those people. Yeah. yeah. So I'm wondering if that, if like all that footage they got similar to summer of soul was that kind of just sitting around somewhere you know buried yeah. and they kind of dug it up yeah 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 amazing um all right the next one we have is flea which we touched on a little bit earlier flea here we go recounted mostly through animation to protect his identity amin or amin looks back over his past as a child refugee from afghanistan as he grapples with a secret he's kept hidden for 20 years. I have a couple little notes on this one. As we mentioned, it's the first documentary to ever be nominated for Best Documentary Feature, Animated Feature, and International Feature. And what did you think when you saw Flea for the first time? Well, it was at Sundance, um, and uh, it's, a, it's an extraordinary uh, movie, and it, it stayed with me uh, for <laughs> ever since. I mean, it's, it's over a year later now. Um, it, it, and it went through, it played at uh, Cannes, and it played at New York, and, you know, it's, it's been playing at all the different film festivals and, and racking up um, a lot of uh, awards along the way. Um, it, part of it is that it's amazing, it, it, the animation itself, the, the, the fact that they needed to protect the identity of, mm-hmm. of the subject, the fact that you're hearing the real voice of the subject. But there's also some uh, actors involved mm. because they have to be able to do the voice of the young um, uh, um, Amin and, and so on. So it's an interesting um, amalgam of, it's a hybrid in, in many ways of a narrative and a, and a, and a nonfiction mm. um, film. It's just so artfully done, uh, so beautiful, so touching. Um, and I know a lot of people uh, love it. It's just a question, of, again, of, of, of how many yeah. uh, see it. And it's possible that the big win for this one is being in all those categories, mm-hmm. nominated in all those categories and having that record as opposed to winning any mm-hmm. one of them. And documentary is the one that it should win yeah. and could win of, mm-hmm. of all three. Okay. Okay. That's the most likely. We touched on Sundance right there. What role does Sundance have in the documentary space that it might that might be different than like the narrative features? Um is it it's very important yeah it's for documentary festival if you're a documentary filmmaker mm-hmm. your hope your prayer is that you do get into sundance because it's the most competitive mm. so there are the gatekeepers the, the the most extraordinary list gets in there and great great movies don't get in and and filmmakers are crying in their beer <laughs> every year 
because they didn't get in. So yeah. after that, they go on to South to South by Southwest or to or to uh, Tribeca because there's so many films. Yeah. There's so many docs. It's the golden age of documentaries now. The volume is extraordinary, and in order to get into Sundance and in order is you have to and and to be chosen there, you're you're really at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. And so that's why so many films move on. Mm -hmm. Many of the films we're discussing did debut at Sundance. Okay. And, uh, yeah. And therefore, um, you know, it's it's a question of of uh, really giving a whole. Uh, after that, you get the launch, and after that, you can move on to to everything else. Yeah. And and the there are movies that that open later in the year. Um, Free Solo is the one that actually did you know win win best uh, documentary without being at, at Sundance. But it's it's actually a good a good thing, and mm. and uh, you can do it. You don't have to be there, but if you right. get there, it's a good thing. Right. All right. Uh, the next we have is Summer of Souls, the other one we touched on earlier. In his acclaimed debut as a filmmaker, Amir Questlove Thompson presents a powerful and transporting documentary, part music film, part historical record, created around an epic event that celebrated black history, culture, and fashion. Um, and why do you think this is resonating with people so much? This this story, the way it's crafted, like why is it working so much? Do you think? Well, it was the same year as Woodstock, and I I was a um, I was very young, but I did drive by Woodstock, and and I knew all about it. And this particular concert was taking place in my neighborhood in mm. New York, wow. not far from where I lived on 110th Street. And I knew nothing about it. I had no idea that it ever occurred. And they, the people who shot this footage tried to get it out and tried to, to get something shown. And no one was interested in it back then. Uh, mm -hmm. None of the networks or, or the usual distribution outlets, and and so it's it's a discovery of something that was hidden and and buried. It's a it's a celebration. Mm -hmm. It's a revelation. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, it's just so much fun to see John Lindsay, the mayor, when I was growing <laughs> up, you know, and to see. Uh, uh, Sly and the Family Stone in a sort of unleashed kind of way. I mean, mm -hmm. some of these people were when they were on um, when they were performing for white audiences. They kind of cleaned up and softened and and made their uh, performances more palatable. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing to see Nina Simone uncensored and to see to see these these uh, musicians just being themselves and yeah. being played and playing to an audience of their own. I found it extraordinary. And what Questlove brings to it is his own context and knowledge and and erudition in terms of putting it together. And he's a first time filmmaker. So it's sometimes fun to, I mean, he had producers, he had people helping him in the editing room, mm -hmm. of course, but it's sometimes fun to see um, um, a, a kind of innovative and fresh approach to putting a, a movie like that together. It wasn't at all expected. Yeah, It had all kinds of interviews added and context added and and history added that made it so much richer it's a great movie yeah it did it did feel unique and 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 fresh and i read an article on indiewire from one of uh, your reporters that that in the lead up to the nominations being announced for the oscars was contemplating whether it could get a nomination for editing um and it was a beautifully edited film and just the pacing, you know, from allowing some of those musical numbers just to like, just to, we could just be there and watch the whole performance. But then also some of these other sections, specifically when it was talking about the oppression people were, were, were experiencing, you know, some of those were quicker. Some of those had like that montage feel. I also loved in, in that movie, they had this one section where they were showing some of the musicians nowadays they were interviewing them and showing them the footage of the festival which they probably hadn't seen and that you know, was great ah it's just like there was so it was, there was so much heart in it um and i and also I liked I, I interviewed Questlove at one point and he he said um that that when he set about sort of figuring out how to shape 
the narrative, he was using his DJ uh, skills, mm. you know, that, that he understood you, you, you cut, you know, you throw in Stevie Wonder right there at the beginning, you know, you don't, you don't, um, do it in chronological order. You 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 figure out where the he has a a musician's rhythm uh, to uh. to to the there, there was a I think that's one of the reasons why it works so well. He 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 played it out you know in a particularly uh, effortless beautiful way. Oh, that's fascinating. All right, and the last nominee we have is writing with fire. In one of the most socially oppressive and patriarchal states of India emerges a newspaper run entirely by rural women belonging to the delete or untouchable community. Mira, its popular political reporter, decides to magnify the local paper's impact with an audacious move to transform from print to a digital news agency. Working in media, dark villages, mocked and discouraged, this is the story of a visionary women's feisty spirit in building what will probably be the world's first digital news agency run entirely by rural, delete women. Um, so as you mentioned, this one is, is going to be debuting on television shortly before the Oscars. Is that what you said? It's either the I just wrote this out. It's yeah. either the day before or the day after. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, that that's... That's PO, kind of uh, yeah. inter- interesting that it hasn't really. Well, it got picked up very late in the day too. I mean, it did mm. have a, a qualifying theatrical release. It played at Film Forum okay. in New York. They held it over because it did so well. Oh, wow. I mean, a lot of I predicted this was going to get nominated on the basis of all these people telling me how much they liked it. Mm. Um, it's a movie that is so inspiring um, because um, these are women who are usually. Uh, cast aside you know they are expected nothing is expected of them they are they are not they are the most subject to violence um uh they're the the poorest cast in india the lowest cast and so and they're women you know again you know another uh, uh thing that is not you know um expected nothing is, is expected of them and they're they're negotiating with their own families their husbands sometimes, and and with the men out there in the world to get the to get the access to to the information that they're uh, revealing to the world and what may, that that thing you mentioned the fact that they moved to digital yeah it's an illiterate a lot of illiterate people out mm-hmm. there who were able to watch video who are able to watch their phones who are able to see these stories unfold that they would shoot with their iPhones yeah. the iPhone became their weapon and their shield mm-hmm. and they could go out into the world and capture this extraordinary footage and be i just was so impressed with how strong and resilient yeah. and they walked miles in their sandals, you know, yeah. in dusty, awful environments. And they were in dangerous places with a lot of men around who were hostile to them. And mm-hmm. yet they were able to to uh, stand up and get these stories. And, and one of the things that's really fun is watching how the website exponentially grows. Yeah. It gets a million and goes further. And it is huge now and, and powerful. Mm-hmm. And so it's just a great, great, great story and it's told by these two filmmakers a couple who are based in delhi and this is their again this is their rookie filmmaking debut wow so we have a feature they did a lot of shorts but they're doing their first feature so that means we have a few first-time feature directors in this category which is really exciting and I, i know for me i couldn't help but be inspired watching this uh, this documentary and also reflect on my own practice as a documentarian, as a cinematographer, you know, just watching the bravery and tenacity with which these women did their jobs. And, and they grew, they grew. That was, they were taught how to do it. They were, there's that first meeting where you see that they can barely use the phone. Mm-hmm. And, and that they aren't, you know, super sophisticated in terms of their education or their knowledge of the world or anything. And yeah. you watch those those minds expand mm-hmm. and they become something yeah. mo- more than anyone ever expected of them. That's yeah. so moving. It's so moving. And and also, as I mentioned at the at the top of the show, I really enjoy seeing the the breadth of the just styles of documentaries that almost every year are nominated. Like to see this one in there, which, you know, it's not the crispest. It's not the like 
the most cinematic and just gorgeous and everything's flawless in terms of the production, but the story is there. And the story just like comes to life in such a powerful way. Um, and so I'd encourage everyone to check it out as it's coming to audiences um, in a, in a uh, on television soon. Um, all right, so that is our nomination slate. I guess we should wrap it with with your official prediction because that's how prediction shows go, right? I, you know, I I I, w- I was thinking it would be Flea for a long time, but I, I've come around to the idea that in the end, there are more American filmmakers uh, voting here than international. Even though the international side of of the Academy has grown. Uh, quite a bit. Um, so I'm just going to go with, with the popular candidate, Summer of Soul, at this point. Summer of Soul. Awesome. Well, Ann Thompson, thank you so much for My joining pleasure. the show. Keep I up really the good appreciate work. It. Thank you. That's it for episode 49 of the Austin Meyer podcast. Thank you so much for watching and for listening. Hopefully this got you all prepped for your Oscars watch parties your winners pools and brackets and prediction contests (laughs) i wonder what ones of these documentaries that we discussed today which ones of these have you seen which ones haven't you seen what was your favorite documentary of 2021 if you are watching on youtube just drop a comment in the comments section and let me know which what what did you like the best um I'd be curious to check it out if I haven't seen it. I know for me, like we mentioned today on the podcast, I was super surprised to not see The First Wave and The Rescue nominated this year in the documentary category. Is there something that you think was a snub? Were you disappointed to not see? Or maybe you just don't care at all. And that's cool too. You can tell me that. (laughs) If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider sharing it with a friend who also likes documentaries. That would be so appreciated. And with that, I will see you next time on the Austin Meyer Podcast. And until then, go out and tell some stories.